So look, bro. Another reaction video. Another underbelly, underbelly, another underbelly video. And from now on, what I'm gonna start doing is keeping these videos on this channel because uh, I think that's the dopest for me. I ain't finna hold y'all too much longer. I got a lot of videos to do this morning. Hope everybody went hunting. Today is Monday. This is not a Yande video. I'm gonna drop it today on Monday. Uh, shout out to the real fathers out there, man. Let's go. All right, Johnny. How you doing? Johnny, where'd you grow up? Where are you? And it's another thing. It's another thing. When I do the underbelly videos, y'all kept telling me, do Johnny, do Johnny. Understand this, I went to Underbelly and searched Johnny, it's like three or four Johnnies, bro. I hope this is the right one. I hope it is. Where are you from originally? I grew up in the San Gabriel Valley on the border of East LA, Monterey Park, Alhambra area. Which is a predominantly- Asian community. Asian. Even the street signs are in Chinese there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I had both my parents. Um, my father was well, I would say my childhood was kind of like miserable, filled with distrust. My, my, my father was a, a drunk, alcoholic. Um, my mom was Taoist Buddhist. So, you know, it was kind of ran like a dictatorship. And uh, that got to be the completely opposite. Your daddies are out and your moms are Buddhist, which leaves the son confused like them. You know what I'm saying? It's only two ways he can go. And with him doing this interview, I don't think he underbelly got him on here to talk about his Buddhism, if I said it right, no disrespect. Um, I think that turned Johnny into a gangster. He don't look like a smoker to me. He don't look like an alcoholic to me. You can see it in their face, bro. Niggas that use that, them white drugs and drink all, you can see it, bro. I never heard of Johnny, but it's probably finna be a good one. You know, we were really young and, and, and my dad would actually beat us, me and my brother and my mom. I sent my mom to the ICU a lot of times, bunch of times. Uh, so it was very, very chaotic as a kid. Um, and I think, uh, you know, grew up around that type of environment where there was gangs, drugs, violence. Um, you know, we we're low income, not stereotypical Asian, but we didn't really have much money. We grew up around a lot of Hispanics. Um, there was a lot of culture like shock that. as well. Our parents are immigrants, so they didn't really, you know, um, know how to fit in. So we kind of had to learn everything from the streets. You know, when I was young, I had a very peculiar mindset. I, I, I trusted in myself a lot. Hey, is the U.S. the most integrated country? For real, because I don't think that, mind you, I ain't never been out the country before. You know what I'm saying? Only watch it on TV, only watch it whatever. But when it comes to the UK, when it comes to Jamaica, bro, when it comes to Africa, when it comes to Dubai, when it comes to Mexico, when it comes to all these other countries, bro, I don't think they have every race to set up shop in said neighborhood, city, or country like they do in the US, specifically LA. The Mexicans got their shit. The blacks got theirs, the whites got theirs, the Asians got theirs, you know what I'm saying? I think that's the beautiful thing about LA, bro. I'm keeping it 100. You have to adapt or you're gonna get smoked. Let's be real. Of course they got racism out there or whatever the case, that shit happens. But if you wanna move around, if you wanna be somebody, you gotta learn how to get along with everybody, bro. Or you're gonna be a nobody, for real. Because I felt like I couldn't trust my parents. Uh, one time, you know, I was 10 years old and I got jumped for the first time. Had my backpack stolen, had my, my, my shoes taken. Uh, I went home and, and my father asked me, where is your backpack? Where is your stuff? And I said, you know, I, I got jumped by four Hispanics, you know? And he didn't believe me. He thought that I threw away my backpack. He thought that I wasn't trying to do good in school. So he beat me uh, after that. So yeah, I kind of went through a lot with, with the beatings and a lot of trauma. And so at the age of 12 years old, I actually joined a gang. Um, I joined the, the watchings, the Chinese triad type of gang out in that area, very big, big gang. So these um, are Asian gangs? Yes, a lot of Asian gangs out there. Um, we're very you got Asian gangs in LA, then you got Asian gangs in LA. You got Asian gangs in California, then you got Asian gangs in California. What I mean by that is, what he's talking about, that's something that came from Asia, you know what I'm saying? 
They not letting no blacks join. They ain't letting no white boys join. It's all, you know what I'm saying? And then you come to California, you hear about people like the Asian boys. That's what I mean. Asian gangs and Asian gangs. The Asian boys, they crips. You know what I'm saying? They migrate around black people. Some of their own kind too, but they banging is way different. They basically on some family. We ain't letting nobody take over our territory. We the triads, bro. You in it till you dead types, whatever the case. The Asian boys, even though they from their country, they gang banging on the streets. They say enemies, they pop. These fools ain't sliding on no ops. I promise you, bro, gang is not sliding. They, they move a little different. That's what I'm saying. If you up in L.A., bro, you can't adapt. You're going to die or be in the house or be in jail. For real. Very incognito, hush-hush, tight lip, but they do exist. And um, so I joined that at 12 years old. And a lot of people ask me, you know, why would you join that? You know, why would you join a gang, you know, at the age of 12? And a lot of people will say it's probably due to, you, don't even you know, know, their bro. broken home or broken family or drugs or violence just the environment for me when you 12 years old bro i don't care who you are when you 12 years old listen to me i don't care what city state or country you in when you 12 years old you ain't got it in your mind i'm gonna join the gang because i come from a broken home bro you just bad it look appeasing you want to get some money they always eating they never look like they starve, and they always got a smile on your face. That's why you want to join the gang. You don't be like, I'm from a broken home. It be the reason, and you don't know the reason. Meaning, yes, you join the gang from you because you're from a broken home, but at 12 years old, you don't have the wherewithal to really dig down deep in yourself to be like, let me join them because what I need, I ain't getting it from home, so I'm going to try to get it from them types. You subconsciously join the gang because you were from a broken home. You don't do it purposely. You know what I'm saying? That's the... I watch a lot of interviews when it comes to Chicago, when it comes to New York, and you always got these people that say they start gang banging early, and I look at comments and be like, how you was banging at nine years old? How you was banging at 10 or 11 years old? Y'all fools must live in Calabasas, bro. Boston somewhere, because I'm going to keep it real with you. Banging at 10 years old is a real thing. Banging at 11 to 12 years old is a real thing. For real, bro. And I'm talking about going to juvenile hall, carry a gun, slide no enemies. You 13 year old. Where you from over here? Now you squabbling the enemy that's 20 years old, bro. That's real life. Banging has no age. If somebody that's 24 years old see you on the corner and you 13 years old, it's okay for him to smoke you. That's law. Ain't nobody finna be like, bro, you killed the kid. No, he killed the enemy. He killed the op. I'm being real with you. Particularly, in my opinion, I noticed that uh, it oh stemmed from trusting and believing myself. Um, when I was young, I, I thought that if I did everything I wanted to do, I would be happy. So having fun, going out with gang members, stuff like that I thought was really fun. And the things that I didn't want to do, such as, you know, um, exercising, school. studying, doing homework vegetables. I didn't do because I thought if I did everything I wanted to do I would be happy and, the and it's like that with most kids that's why I got in trouble at a young age bro you never know what's good for you till you get older and really get on your own hold on one second let me get this lighter The things that I didn't want to do, I didn't do because I didn't think it would make me happy. So uh, I looked at the gang life and it, it started at the core of my heart. It looked you know, I dope. really wanted to be um, the biggest. a gang member. I really wanted to. I looked up to those people. And so I joined that, that type of lifestyle. Uh, 12 months, I'm sorry, three months into it at the age of 12, I caught my first case. Um, and that was... A 
Told y'all, bro. And mind you, he caught his ca first case just off being bad. He not finna say he smoked nobody. It's just that when you're 12 years old, another thing, crime is like leveling up, going from the 6th to the 7th grade, the 9th to the 10th grade, 11th to the 12th grade. Crime is like you used to play JV, now you're on Bar City. Crime is like I ain't never did nothing in my life. Your first time doing something, you're still in a piece of candy bar. That's what bro finna say, you know what I'm saying? At 12 years old, you don't jump straight to murder. You don't. It's gotta be an accident or some shit. He caught his first case, probably Life is, I love these interviews. Originally a kidnapping slash robbery, but they dropped the charges down. Uh, at 12 years old. At 12, yeah. And ended up, um, it was with a group of people, of course, but ended up uh, catching the charge for dissuading a witness for the benefit of a gang. So uh, ended up going to YA, right. um, California Youth Authority. Youth Authority. I was yeah. at SRCC first and then um, caught a couple fights in there, got written up. They call it level Bs. And then ended up going to Fred C. Nellis, Nellis YA. <clears throat> and, you know, I was 12 years old. They gave me four years. Um, and when I was in Woo. YA, I, I learned a lot of... That's what I'm saying with you kids, bro. Understand that you still can go to jail. Woo! I went to juvie, right? Only for four months. <laughs> Hold on, for. I'm lying. I went for 106 days. That's not even four months. Anyway, bro did four years from 12 to 16 years old, bro. All that still a candy and trying to hold guns and this music got you thinking that you King Von and you got to... You need to go to jail, bro. You ain't even had no pussy yet. You don't even know how to... You don't even know about life yet. What's 12 years old? What's that? Seventh grade? It's like seventh grade, six, seven, somewhere around there, seventh grade. Yeah. You gonna finish school while you in YA. Only thing that's, I'm not gonna say the only thing that's good about YA, but I promise you, anybody that go to YA and do four years, they come out way tougher than they was than when they went in there. And they got a different outlook on life. And they more mature than every 16 year old that's out on the streets, bro. They is. YA, you got Juvie, then you got YA, then you got County Jail, then you got the prison, right? YA is like Baby County. It goes down in there, bro. It goes down in YA. I'm not even lying. Like it cultivated the mindset to believe in myself even more. I really trusted myself because I had seen rapes, I had seen murders, I had seen stabbings, fightings. I've, I learned how to fight there. They call it gladiator school for a reason. You know, you fight a lot. And um, I learned like the two second takeoff rule, meaning if you feel disrespect. Two seconds, bro. This is what he finna say. This is it's an LA fool for real. And I thought only certain like sexes and certain gangs that ran by this, bro. It's like this in a club. It's like this at a football game, basketball game. It's like this at high school, bro. It's like this at anywhere you at in LA. Look. When you at the mall, of course you be aware, aware of your surroundings, right? If you walk in and somebody look at you and they look back, they aware of their surroundings. Same with you. If you look at somebody and you just continue what they're doing. But that split second longer, if you look at a nigga for two seconds, then they turn to two and a half, you fire on, bro. Not even lying. Or he finna get off on you. you it's like a timer you got in your mind that been built since you was like 10 years old. I'm talking about the two second rule. And that goes for both sides, for you and the other person. Like what's up, now you got a problem after two and a half seconds. Or bro gonna say it, or he just gonna fire you on you. Or you just gonna fire on him. That's how it is, bro. I like Johnny. Respect it. Within two seconds, you have to handle it. Whether it's stabbing them, fighting them, beating them up. Otherwise, you'll be labeled a punk, excuse my language, a bitch, a leva, stuff like that. So, um, you know, I did four years there and it was really, really traumatic. And um, I get out, you know, 67 days, two months and a week. Uh, I catch my second case. This time I'm an adult. They try me as an adult. Uh, it's two counts of assault with deadly weapon. After um, two months? Again, it was, it was supposed to be a robbery and attempted, but they dropped the charge down. I pled out. Um, they gave me 10 years, 85%, so eight and some change. And what gave him 10 years was the YA charge. 
He already had something on his record. Then he had a violent offense on his record. And then it's both times he went to jail for the kidnapping and they dropped both charges. They had to tell him, Johnny, we're not playing with you. They gave about 10 years. He was only out for two months. His life got washed at 12 years old, bro. 12 years old, you get out when you're 16 years old. And then at 16 years old, you catch a 10-year case. That means he said 10 years with 85%, so he probably did like eight years, eight and a half years. Bro, 25, 26 years, his, his whole life, been, since he was 12 years old, bro. Since he was 12 years old, bro. It's crazy. Um, so, yeah, I get to prison, and it's a whole nother ball game. <laughs> it's, uh, first off, I'm Chinese, so, so being there, we were outnumbered. Um, it really was a racial thing where the Chinese is the smallest racial up in prison. That's a fact. Prison YA, it was more of gangbang. It was a little bit of race, but you had to represent your, your, your colors, represent your flag, represent your, your, your people. YA County Jail, it, it do be about gangbanging. Even up in prison, it be about gangbanging. But the main thing, look, up in prison, you still got all the gangs, right? But when it goes down and it's time to get cracking, let's say a riot or something, bro. Bloods in LA, you got the Hoovers, you got the Six O's, you got the BPS Joe, you got the Bloods, the Crips, and the Hoovers in LA. They all black gangs. So with that being said, when it's time to get cracking for real, all them black gangs that I just named that don't get along on the streets, they come together in the pen because now it's a race thing. You got the blacks. You got the Woods, you got the Essays, and you got the Asians, bro. That's all that matters in prison. I ain't talking about jail. I'm talking about YA. I'm talking about juvie. I'm talking about the pen, the penitentiary, prison. Race matters, bro. Like a muff. But when you go to prison, you have to drop your flag. You have to drop everything, and you have to... No, you don't. That right there is wrong, bro. He's speaking on actual gang colors by dropping your flag. That's not the case, bro. You don't have to drop your flag when you go to prison and just say, we're black, brother. <laughs> oh, still over there banging you, still with the homies until something happened. You know what I'm saying? Up in prison, your enemies that's on the streets are still your enemies up in prison until a real riot kick off. You gotta come to together, represent. Bro the other car or the, the 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 race right so in there i had to calm down because i was a ya baby um i didn't know how to program after about a year i learned how to real. program the rules the regulations and everything and a ya baby a real i was LA able to <laughs> uh, really start to kind of function in prison um you know i went through a lot of depression um Normal. so i had uh seen some counselors in there you know just being honest like I, I was able to get my GED. I was able to get anger management, counseling, and um, everything looked on the up, but there was one thing that I really couldn't get rid of, and th it was this emptiness and this void I had felt inside of my heart. No matter what I did, I really couldn't um, overcome this emptiness and this void. And uh, it didn't matter what I did. You know, I just always felt this sadness and, and feeling inadequate as a human being. And so, you know, some of the, the older homies, the people in there, the, the, the people who kind of like represent us, they, we usually look to them for advice. So uh, one of the older guys, some old Chinese dude, he's like, bro, you should start reading, you know, and, and working out and, and kind of get your mind off of things. Because he noticed that I was kind of like an overthinker. And um, so I started reading. I read the Quran in there front to back three times, read the Bible in there front to back two times. Um, and you know, it didn't really do anything for me, honestly. So I'm not going to speak on that all the way about the Bible and all that types, but for me, bro, like I live real life, just like y'all do. And when I say real life, I ain't saying that, oh, I had a tougher life than y'all or nothing like that. Right. And just that in my life, this is real life that I live. Um, growing up, bro, nine times out of 10 growing up. When you first come home, your family is already a religion, whether it's Christian, Muslim, uh, Jehovah's, you, you already have a religion you come home to. So of course, after a while, once you grow up, that's what you become. But for me, for me, I'm not a gullible type of person, you know what I'm saying? 
the Bible just stopped making sense to me. It did. Um, and it's just my opinion. A man walking on water, and putting two different type of animals on a boat, somebody living up in the sky. and It just didn't make no sense to me, bro. You biting an apple, you, you... It just seemed like a good... A good book to me. And everything that happened in my life, bro. Oh, God, this guy, he got... I felt like... The only thing he had me on is me being alive, if it was real. People tell me, like, what's going to happen when you die? Like, it's nobody that's alive died before, so how you know? And don't tell me you read this book, because it's... So I just stopped, like, nobody can't tell me nothing, man. I feel like it's a higher power, and nobody know who he is. And I'm set with that. That's exactly how I feel. How you gonna be living and go tell me what's gonna happen when I die? You ain't even die yet. You know what I'm saying? Um, I get out after doing my stretch. I parole out of CRC Norco, and um, I meet my mom. You know, and uh, she didn't really visit me much. She's an older lady. She didn't know how to navigate the correctional facilities and stuff like that. So she didn't really visit me. But I noticed a difference in my mom. You know, she had this uh, this inner peace about her that I, I really didn't understand because. <clears throat> Your son in jail. Mind you, she's, she has not just me, but my brother, two kids in prison um, who are incarcerated. Right. My, my brother did also 12 years. And um, she, had, she was still married to my father, her husband, who was still an abusive, alcoholic person. She still lived in Section 8. She still had you know, all that trauma and, and, and stuff like that. But she had no circumstances to be happy, but I, I, I realized that she was happier than I was. You know? And so I asked my mom. My mom, you in jail she not? why are you so happy? You know, what, what changed? And then she mentioned church. And at that time, honestly, it's like I rolled up the car, the windows in the car, you know, I was like, <laughs> oh, I'm shit. not trying to hear about that, mom. I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm not, right. I don't believe in God. We we're raised Buddhist. I'm good. So she said, fair enough. You know, she didn't push. She didn't say anything. She just let me be. So as I got out, I had that heart that I wanted to still do better and do good. You know, I had lived my, my whole life doing bad things and following myself, trusting myself. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wanted to get a job. I wanted to help my parents out, you know? And um, I tried to look for a job, but as a two-strike felon with a violent crime, oh my God. that wasn't happening. You gotta be a YouTuber. <laughs> I'm being real, but that's the thing about YouTube. YouTube say lies, bro. You can have a record to do this. You got two strikes, a two-strike felon, bro. The car wash not even fucking with you. You know what I'm saying? I wonder what bro doing now, because I can guarantee you, if it's a legal job, it's a job. They got jobs. Up, it's a lot of places up in L.A. that got jobs to where they only hire felons because they know that bro probably just messed up in his life once or twice. He got booked, and they put it. They give people a second chance. I don't care if you got the best resume from Harvard. If you're not a felon, they won't hire you. It's a grip of jobs out there in L.A. like that, bro. If he ain't working from one of them, I know for a fact that these targets, the Walmarts, the, they look at you on paper, bro. They don't look at you in your face and talk to you. They'll see your parent and be like, nope. He a felon. He did what? He went to jail twice for murder? Don't even know that both times you did go to jail for murder is you smoked both the dudes that raped your sister and your mama. But they don't care. It just say you got two felons for murder. We not hiring him. Promise you, bro. They just read the man. I hate this. I I love it, but damn, man. But I I applied for even like McDonald's, FedEx, UPS, all the places that they say they hire convicted felons. No, they don't. And I I wasn't showing any love, honestly. Bro, that's a rumor. That's a rumor. These corporations are not high. These food chains and corporations are not. Bro, you can work at Towns Burger, probably. You know what I'm saying? At Fallas, <laughs> you can work at the local smoke shop, bro. You can work at the Mexican chicken, uh, uh, whatever, La Villa or something like that. You know, you work at Roberto's. But as far as your real chain, bro, they looking at that paper like, uh-uh, you stupid. Yeah, but I'm just trying to wash cars. Nope, you're going to smoke somebody. That's how they, I promise you. But um, immediately I went back to the streets. You know, I started to sell drugs again. And at that time, 
you know, I was still on parole. So it was very risky looking over my shoulder and I just felt like- But what you gonna do, be bro? something no. I could make a career out of. You gotta get it somehow. So, um, Think about how scandalous that is, bro. Let me tell you how scan. It's like, it's cap. It's cold, bro, it's wrong. You can go to jail, be labeled a felon, right? Get out on parole. Nobody will hire you because you're a felon. Your parole officer is going to tell you, you better get you a job in 30 days. Let, how we finna make this make sense? I'm a, I, nobody's going to hire me. I'm a felon. But if I don't get a job in 30 days, you're sending me back to jail. I'm telling you, bro. That's what they say. Once you're in the system, you're going to be in there for the rest of your life. I promise you, you're going to be in there for the rest of your life, bro. This whole thing is just rich. And it's crazy that you got people. That's what I be saying, bro. Every time I see the president in the office, I, I'd be like, go for president. I'm breaking all the rules. Every time I see a president in the office, I'd be like, that ain't really him. It's just the face, bro. I feel like they already got a rule book and set. You say what you got to say at these press conferences, bro. We nominated you. We just need somebody here. In four or eight more years, we'll get a new face up in here. Because there's no way in hell. It's no way in hell. That none of these presidents, who was it, Ronald Reagan or somebody that came with the three strikes law? It was either him or Bill Clinton, I forgot. Anyway, it's no way in hell that the presidents after him or after them got into office and didn't feel like, man, we need to change that. That's messed up. Nobody, bro. A three strike law is, push, I promise you. They, you mean to tell me out of my whole life, I only got three mistakes to make. Not even three, two. You got two mistakes to make. Because on your third one, you don't get another chance after your third one. You're going to jail. So after you make these two mistakes, you get another one, you're going to jail, bro. I'm not lying. They don't be like, okay, you got three felonies. Your next one, you're out. Nope. You got two felonies. Your next one, you're gone. I hate it, You know, bro. I devised this plan to actually rob a, a drug dealer, you know, because my thinking at the time was, if I'm selling all these drugs, it's risky. But if I just rob someone who sells all the drugs, then I would inherit and, and gain a lot of money. Or so get I had, smoked. I had, it was me and a friend of mine. He was like my road dog. And I told him, hey, bro, let's, let's rob this dude. He's a well-known drug dealer in our area. Anyway, um, you know, I told him I was going to go to the right of the car. He was going to go to the left of the car. And, um, you know, when I stepped to go to the right of the car, he actually, my friend, stepped in front of me. So naturally, I went to the left of the car. As I'm walking up on the, the driver's side of the car, I hear three gunshots, you know. And when it rang out, I actually assumed initially that it was my friend who, who shot the dude. You know, I was like, damn, you didn't even give him a chance. Well, right. whatever, you know, it is what it is. We'll roll with the punches. We're very cold like that. But actually, the car sped off and I realized it was my friend that had gotten shot. Mm -hmm. And a um, friend took them three bullets for me. For some reason, his fan didn't listen, bro, and go to the left side of that car. He stepped in front of me. And that's what happens. You know what I'm saying? Dude, that is, I love this food interview. You know, he was just laying there. I remember vividly, like, the sounds, the noise that he was making. And, and he was dying. And there I'm holding him, and he died in my arms, you know? And, yes, yeah, so every time I think about that, I get a little emotional, but... Um, I feel like it's your fault. You know, I... I that moment was very pivotal in my life because I had thought about it like that was supposed to be me. Actually, if I went to the right of the car, I, I would have been, I probably wouldn't be here today. And let me tell you the cold thing about this. Let me tell you the cold thing about this. You see how he planned to hit the lick on a drug dealer and the drug dealer smoked his homie? The drug dealer is going to go to jail for that murder, not him, right? Now, what if, if old boy didn't have no drugs? Listen to me, this is how it works. The drug dealer gonna go to jail for the murder. He got the burner on him, ain't supposed to have you in California, you got drugs on you. You smoked this with somebody that tried to rob you. They, his lawyer could say self-defense, but mm -mm, not happening. The cool thing about it is, if he didn't have the drugs on him, then Johnny went to jail, would've went to jail for the murder. You the one that planned this attack. Told him to run up on old boy. Y'all tried to rob him and he killed your homie. You going to jail for the murder. But just cause old boy has some drugs on him, they gonna get him for it. You know what I'm saying? That's how life works. Well, that's how LA works. 
So, you know, as I seen that, I started to really think in my life, like I could feel death around the corner. You know, it didn't matter what I would do. I, I felt like my time, I was on borrowed time. I felt like I was going to die soon. Mm. And three days after that, I had received a, a letter from one of my, my friends, just a childhood friend. He grew up with us in the projects and Section 8. He, um, he gave me a letter that, that was really eerie. You know, he's like, you know, think about me when I'm gone and just saying these types of things. And, and three days after that, I find out that he had committed suicide in, in jail. So there was death all around me and I was feeling that, you know, it was creeping up on me. And, um, you know, miraculously, my mom actually, uh, a couple of days after these incidents had happened, um, her car had broken down and she was like, hey, Johnny, like, um, I need you to take me to church. You know, she's a translator. She was very like involved at the time. And so I said, oh, I'm finna go light my thing <laughs> I said, yeah, there's no harm in that. You know, I want to help mom out. You know, I, I didn't spend all my life, you know, being bad to her. So I wanted to treat her well. So I, I took her to the church. But I told her very specifically, I don't want to be I'm not going in. I don't want to, I don't want to talk to the pastor. Yeah. Um, and so when I get there, I remember this pastor runs out. And he's like, hey, John. I had to barely get some soundproof on your windows or close the window or move this to the next room because every interview... We hear them cars on the street. That was a Honda Civic that drove by, bro. So, but no, that's what moms try to do, bro. And it's understandable. You can't fall for you. They baby. They up in church. No matter how many times you say you don't want to go, no matter how you, talk, you can say you cool a million times, they're going to keep on trying to keep on trying to get you. You, are the, you they baby. You only want right for them, bro. And if you feel like God did wonder for you, of course you want him to do wonder for your kids. Johnny, you know. Good to see you, and, and why don't you come on in for some food, you know? And they had made, like, some, like some black bean noodles. And that's actually my favorite dish. You know, I love eating black bean noodles. For those Asian Sundong people out there who know what I'm talking about. Black bean noodles. Bro, I love Chinese, Asian, and Japanese food. I ain't never seen no black bean noodles. What is it? Noodle beans floating in water? What is black bean noodles is the bean in a noodle form you know how you can get the bean it's like this but you could probably stretch it to like a skinny noodle and you put it in the water black i ain't I've never seen no black bean noodles it's like a delicacy for us you know i grew up eating that stuff so um i was like what's the harm in eating you know, but I told the pastor, mm -hmm. I that's how they get you. God. I don't believe in God. That's what, that's how they get you. Et cetera, et cetera. So we get there and um, I remember he sits down and after we finish eating, he, he asks me two questions that really kind of shocked me. You know, he said, are you a sinner? And do you know what sin is? And at that time, I felt a little angry, to be honest, because I felt like that was a loaded question. Like, <laughs> Who is, who's not a sinner? You know, we're all born imperfect. We're all flawed as human beings. Right, We've right, all made, right. you know, bad decisions in our life and stuff like that. So I kind of got mad and I told him, yeah, of course. And, and he says, so what do you think about sin? And I said, well, sin is when you do something bad and then, you know, you, you go against God or you, you know, shoot people, stab people, you know, lie to people. That's a sin. And he said, not so. And that was the first time that it kind of like, he shook my world upside down. I was like, what do you mean? You know, this is kind of. This what didn't get me about the whole sin thing. Like I told you, I used to be into it. It's not like I was like this forever. Where it's no sin greater than the other. So therefore, stealing something is just like killing someone. You know what I'm saying? 
But the only thing I don't get about it, bro, it was just messing my mind up. You mean to tell me I could just keep on stealing and keep doing bad and I can ask God to forgive me for my sins and I'll be all right? Jesus died for your sins. He died on the cross and whoopty woo woo That makes zero sense to me, bro. So basically you're telling me I got to get out of jail free car every time I do something. Then you got pastors that been sinning their whole life and they up there, bro, preaching to the crowd. Preaching to the church. You supposed to listen to this nigga? He asked for forg God forgiveness, but how we know God forgave him? God could have been like, nope, and he still got up here preaching to us. How do we know if God forgave you or not? Because people will tell you that God loves you and he will never be mad at you, bro. He's going to forgive everything. I don't think that's the case. I don't think he ain't really on no like. He not soft like that, bro. It's fools in hell right now. You know what I'm saying? I bet you any kind of money, if hell exists and the people that's up in hell right now, they didn't ask for forgiveness before and God was like, nope. And that's why they down here. Why is there a hell if God forgives you for your sin, if he died for your sins? This is something I don't get. The reason I don't get is, I mean... Another thing I don't get is why is there a divorce when it comes to marriage? Who made up the divorce? Marriage should be forever. Shouldn't be no such thing as divorce. If it was up in the Bible that said if you get married, you gotta. I don't know, bro. I just don't rock with it. I just don't rock with it. Sex out of wedlock, having kids out of wedlock. Come on, man. The best people in the world was raised and created by single people, single parents. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I don't get it, man. Don't Weird, because that's what I, I always get it, but Even I though I wasn't my Christian, uh, Catholic, or anything like that, I knew that doing bad things is not, it's a no-no. You know, you don't do that. But he explained to me that sin was actually twofold. Uh, the first thing is, it's trusting yourself above the word of God. So trusting yourself more than God, that's what sin is. And number two, it was inheritance. You know, I, I'm going to the stove every time I got to spark this. But trusting myself more than God is a sin. It's crazy to me, bro. That's it's crazy. Trust in yourself more than God. How do we know what God's saying? Do you trust yourself more than God? That's a sin. What else he got to say? So bro? he explained to me the analogy of you're Chinese. You didn't choose to be Chinese. You right. born that way. Your father was Chinese. His father was Chinese, etc. It was passed down. Likewise, with sin, it wasn't that you did anything wrong, but... Your father, you know, Adam was, uh, was evil, he was sinful, and then it passed down to us. So we were born as sinners. And at that time, it really made sense to me because my son. So if you're a born sinner, why is there a hell? This, he said it makes sense to him, but it don't make sense to me, bro. Everybody want to say it's a bad, this is what I want y'all to answer in the comments. This is what I want y'all to answer, right? Listen, I'm about to give you. Two females in this situation. Two old ladies in this situation. Two regular females in this situation, okay? First female, single mom, five kids. She just got her check. She's back three months on rent, right? Somehow, her SSI check came in. She able to pay her rent because they was about to evict her and her five kids tomorrow, bro. Like, for real, they didn't give her notices. They didn't give her passes. We can let you stay two more weeks. We need that rent. She finally get the money for the rent, right? SSI check, $3,000. Her rent, $2,099. She got enough, bro. She take the check. She about to go to the bank and cash it. On, after, after her, uh, my bad. She on her way to the bank to cash it. She get there. She cash it. After she cash it, she's on her way to the rental office to pay her rent. But on her way to the rental office, she lose the $3,000, right? 
gone. Now she about to get evicted. She just got it. She been praying for it, yada, yada. She got it. She cast it. She lost it. Now, when she loses it, the person that find it is a lady, right? We talking about the second lady whose daughter is at the hospital on some John Q shit. They need a heart transplant. This baby is finna die in four hours. She need $3,000 because the heart transplant is $2,999. She down and out. She's sitting at the bus stop. Whoo, guess what blow past her? The lady check that she just cashed that got the five kids that she about to get evicted. The second lady finds the check. Oh my God, this is just enough to help my daughter get this heart transplant. Who get blessed in this situation? Who is God not rocking with in this situation, bro? That's what I'm saying. I don't get life. Is the lady blessed that found it? Or is God not rocking with the lady that lost it? Y'all let me know, bro. And, you know, he was like four years old at the time. And, you know, I always taught him well. You know, hey, don't, don't follow the way that daddy went. You know, like, be good. Respect your elders, et cetera, et cetera. Never taught him how to lie, steal, or do anything like that. Um, but at the age of four, you know, he loved eating gummy bears. And I remember, like, he would always want gummy bears. If he could just live off of gummy bears, he would do it. But with the veggies, you know, I told him, you have to eat veggies first, and then you can eat some gummy bears. But I would see him trying to hide the veggies, trying to take it to the little potty and throwing it in there. And, you know, who taught him that, you know? And, and he even got to a point where he would, he would steal the gummy bears. He would scoot the little stool over climb on top, reach at the top of the cabinet, and pull out the, uh, the gummy bears. And, and I caught him red handed. I'm like, what are you doing one day? And he was like, nothing, dad, nothing. You know, so who taught him that? I never taught him any of that evil stuff, but it was part of him. And it was something that was actually normal for him. Is he talking, I walked out, but is he trying to say his kid is a born sinner too? And he was- For kids to rebel. And then he used the analogy of an apple tree, which really put it in perspective. He said, when you look at the seeds of an apple, where are the apples? But if you plant it, as it grows, it'll only produce apples. No matter how hard it tries, it cannot produce oranges or mangoes. Likewise, when you look at a baby, where is the sin? It's very cute, it's From loving. Adam. But as it grows, as it matures, all you see is sin. They start to, you know, um, lie. They start to ch cheat, steal. They can even murder, you know? And so when I saw that- I don't think that's a sin. I think that's just part of being a human, bro. That's part of being a human, like, we do sh that we want to do. You can call it a shit or not, but if I'm attracted to women, two women, I'm going to have sex with both of them, bro. If I ain't got the money and my kids can't eat, I'm going to steal this food. Like, I don't, it's just a part of being human. I promise y'all, God and laws to me come hand in hand. You steal, you go to jail. You steal, you go to hell. You kill, you go to jail. You kill, you go to hell. It keeps the world straight. Imagine this world without God and laws. Bro, it'd be like the purge out here. We wouldn't have no cars. We wouldn't have no clothes, bro. Everybody be trying to break in your house right now. You look out the window, there'd be smoke on this block, a fire on this block, people shooting down the street. God and laws is good for the world, bro. That's what I feel. I, I know a lot of y'all real religious ghosts. You tripping. I'm just telling y'all me. I'm just telling y'all me. It really made... Uh, a lot of sense to me as a person. And I was able to see that, oh, we're just being normal. It's not that I did bad things and then I became a sinner. No, I was born flawed. I was born imperfect. And he had mentioned, you're an imperfect person trying to produce born perfect sinner. results. Of course, you're gonna fall short. So that's why I had emptiness and, and depression and loneliness inside of my heart because he was showing me that it wasn't the surface level things, but it was at the core of the heart because everything is rooted in the heart, right? Everything came from, from, from the, the center. Passion so did his job. He I was it. trying to basically put a bandaid like, he oh, I had up. anger, so I take anger management. No, if you look, if you peel back the layers of an onion, you'll realize that you'll get to the root of it, which was sin produces everything. Everything this nigga had going on with his life, that was a sin. The pastor had an analogy for it. And he, he, he made him get the picture. He made him get the picture. Should I be trying to get my son, bro? You give him, you give him analogies at work. You can't, hey, bro, stop being bad and just go finish doing your thing. Now you get bad, it get worse. You get bad there. When you get bad there, you can go to jail, son. You can get smoked for this. You can get, you know what I'm saying? 
Got to give them analogies for And I started to realize, oh, I was looking at it from a wrong perspective. So he said, it's okay, you know, and, and then he used the analogy of like a car. And, and he was saying that uh, there's a braking system in the car and it must overcome the accelerator. Otherwise, you know, if the, if the accelerator overcomes the brake. Different strokes for different, for different folks. Bro knew how to get to him. His mama, mind you, he said he dropped his mama off at church. His mama is deeply in the church. His mama told that pastor about everything her son going through. How he been in jail, how he a gang bagger and all this. She like, I'm going to get him up here one time. Please just talk. I'm telling you. You go to a church, bro. The pastor don't talk to you directly if it's your first time. You know what I'm saying? He got too many people up in there to tend to. He specifically made a mission to tell. He knew Johnny was coming up there, bro. I promise you. He said, hey, just come in and get some food real quick. Captain. We will Captain. crash, right? No one would drive that car, even if it was a Ferrari, because it has no brakes. Likewise, we are people who ha need to have self-control. If we don't have self-control and our desires are like the accelerator, if it keeps going, I want to do drugs, I want to make money, then you'll, if you don't manage that, you'll crash out in life and you'll live miserably. And when he was saying these things, it was hitting me in the core of my heart. Like, wow, this guy knows me, but I just met him. And I really didn't understand how he knew me through and through. You know? good. And good. at that good. time, he said, you're a person because you were born flawed, imperfect, in sin. You don't have the capability to stop yourself. And so you need something else to, to help you. And in that case, he said, that's where I come in as a pastor. He said, I am your breaking system. Right. So at that time, he had asked. Pastors believe that they are God messengers, that they are God senders. Therefore, um. Their whole mission is to turn everybody that they can. That's why you, I don't know what religion he is, but that's why you got Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on your door early Saturday mornings. Like, they feel like if you know about God, your mission is to tell the next person or you're not representing him right. You have to tell the next person. You know what I'm saying? Religion is, is something, it's wild to me. Bro. Ask me. I just don't get how. Like he said, the Buddhism, and you got all these different religions, but it's only one God. If y'all look it up right now, it's over a hundred religions out there, and it's only one God. So that means 99 of them doing it wrong. Not even lying, bro. God worrying about one thing, right? But y'all get on people like me, and a lot of people that don't understand or really believe, but y'all don't get on these different religions that... Um, that live by different things. Some of them call them Jehovah, God. They call their churches different, like church or kingdom hall. Then you got some churches that pass around collection plates. A lot of different religions that tell you God don't need no money. You know what I'm saying? It ain't, it, it's just so confusing to me, bro. It's like, it's like they gang banging. If you talk to one religion, they'll tell you that this religion doing it wrong. If you talk to one another one, they'll tell you like, no, they lying, they doing it wrong. It's fucking, it, it messes my head up, bro. It do. So I don't even, you know what I'm saying? As soon as you decide, as soon as I come, if I was to come out right now and say, yeah, I done did my research on the practice, on the religion, I decided to be a Muslim, I get comments, bro, you tripping. You been like this the whole time, you decided to be Muslim? As soon as I say, yeah, I did my practice, I did, whoa, I decided to be Christian. In the comments, bro, you tripping. Christians don't wooty woo woo. I got no time for that, bro. I don't. I ain't got no time for that. Uh, this one question, and he said, How is your relationship with your father? I said, It's horrible. I honestly hate him. You know, I I feel like the reason why I joined a gang, the reason oh, why I was son, angry, the reason why I was so like, me, violent was because of my father. But he had mentioned, Okay, so listen to me very carefully, he said. When you meet your father, I want you to apologize to him. And I was like, what? Excuse my language, but I was like, fuck that. Honestly, because I didn't ask to be born. Um, he had a responsibility to take care of me. But when I was born, you know, he beat me and he didn't, he wasn't there for me. And I felt like just so angry when he, he asked me to apologize to him. And you know what he said was, he said, Johnny, you're right. 
But because you're right, you know, that he beat you and you didn't have a good childhood. That made you understand You're also miserable. And that hit me, you know, really deeply. You're miserable because when you go outside and you see and fathers who, who do respect their children, who did raise them well, um, you know, you, you feel that pain. And he said, you know, why do people argue? Why do people fight? Why is there no peace? Because two people are right. It would never be You're no right, peace. I'm wrong. The other party Ever. thinks, no, I'm right, you're wrong. Ever. Right? And then they start to fight. And then there's no peace. But when one person becomes wrong, he says, then everything drops and then they can start to heal. Peace starts to come in, you know, and they're able to grow. So he said, even though you don't understand it, I ask that you accept what I'm saying and just move forward. So at that time, I put down everything I felt and I trust. He trying to raise this nigga in one session. <laughs> he telling Johnny, look, he gave it for a whole serum. And like, I just came to drop my mama off, bro. It all started with dropping her off. Then come in to eat. Then can I talk to you for a minute? And then, and then you get here. Johnny respect, bro, though. You know what I'm saying? Some people that you respect off rip, and that's one of them. Johnny respect him off rip. Trusted this man, right? And I was like, okay, I'm not gonna trust myself. Let me see what he says, and let me just try it out. You know, what's the harm in trying it out? So I call my father, and it's such an awkward phone call. I haven't talked to him for years. And I say, hey, dad, it's Johnny. He's like, who? <laughs> like, it's, it's your son. He's like, oh. And the first thing out of his mouth I remember vividly was, Johnny better than me, bro. Johnny better than me. My pops got life in prison, right? He went to life. He got life when I was 10 years old for a murder. Um, for the longest. Calling periodically, but I didn't care. And then it became a while from when I was 16 till I was 19 years old. I ain't talked to bro one time, so I'm like, fuck that nigga. You know what I'm saying? He better call me. I ain't finna call him. I'm his son. But he in jail, dude. Nah, 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 nah. My mama, my grandma, my auntie's like, I don't care, bro. You can pick up the phone. I know about jail. Back then, it was the Green Dot, the JPay. You know what I'm saying? You could never tell us anything. Wasn't getting nothing. Finally called me two days after my 20th birthday. I want to first start off by saying, I'm sorry, yada, yada, yada. I don't want to hear none of this shit, bro at all. In my mind, I'm just like, right then and there. It's my pops, you know what I'm saying? Right then and there. I was like, as soon as he said that, I'm like, this fool keep on calling me with this. I might forgive him, but I hope he don't think I'm some buster ass, like, to go ahead and be like, oh, you sorry for me? All right, for sure, pops. Whoop, whoop, whoop. He did. He kept doing it over and over and over. So that's how I made it, my relationship back with my pops when I was 20. But it was fucking him for a while, bro. It was fucking for a while. When I told y'all I was in Juvie, it was a, it was when I went to Juvie, right? It was a time. At that time, uh, me, my mama, and my daddy was in jail at the same time. <laughs> That's a ratchet shit. I swear to God on my life, bro. Me, my mama, and my daddy was in jail at the same time, bro. I couldn't call nobody. <laughs> but my auntie, <coughs> she used to always have, she used to be like, your mama gonna call. So this back then with the house phones. You know what I'm saying? And um, the little chirps and all that. Your mama gonna call at 3 o'clock. Uh, make sure you call. I'm gonna put you on three way. And whoop de whoop whoop. Or she tell me to call my cousin. My cousin used to have the phone with the church phone, hold the church phone. It was crazy, bro. It was crazy. But my pops never went to that to try to talk to me in my, while I was in jail. My mama was in jail, was trying to talk to me like a month. But like when my son could tell him to call him here. I'm like, this, this time. Uh, I don't have any money whoop. for you. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I got a little angry, you know, and I need your money, but kind of simmered down and I was like, you know, dad, I just want to talk to you. I, it's really urgent. I need to speak to you about something. I said, okay. So we plan to go to this pho restaurant in That's Alhambra. Another thing. I'll never call and another man daddy. We get there. He's <laughs> sitting across from me. I'll never forget. It's awkward. There's so much tension. He's not looking at me in my face. I'm looking off to the wall and 
And I re but I remember vividly what the pastor told me, you know, just move forward, just apologize. It's okay. You know, I am your braking system, right? So I told him, Dad, you know, I'm here today to tell you that I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being a bad son. I'm sorry for being a bad. Damn. That emotion, bro. That emotion. Feel for John. And it's with your parent, bro. That emotion is crazy. I dropped a video yesterday on my channel called OG Ghost, right? And I did one where the police, they pulled this man over and they socked him in the face and he started crying. Y'all like, Ghost, you gotta understand, he got hit in the face, that's why he was crying. You know how the police do black people. They would have probably, he probably thought he was about to get smoked or whatever, right? After they start beating him up. And I was telling y'all that physical pain the way I grow up, the way I grew up, you don't let another man see you weak. When you get punched on, bro, it's up to you to cry or not. Yes, it hurts, but it's up to you to show the emotion, physic, you know what I'm saying? Emotionally, why old boy was crying? My mama just passed, why I be crying over that? It ain't no lifting weights for that, bro. No push-ups you can do for that. Your heart is your heart, you know what I'm saying? You can't change that. So emotions is something you can't control. When a grown man cry emotionally, respect it. He got a heart. But if a grown man cry because another grown man punched him or choked him out, that's what I was raised not to do. Never show, never show no weakness, you know what I'm saying? And that's how I live. I don't care if I get jumped, bro, shot, whatever. Yes, it hurt. But crying, bro. Y'all probably think I'm. It's just how I'm. I'm. I'm not a cry. I'm not for the cry, bro. Not off no physical pain. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. When y'all be seeing these um movies and hear how people get tortured, whatever the case, it look like the worst of the worst. They be screaming. It hurt. But if y'all go back to that video. To be crying and weeping like he was, bro. Oh, these white people socking him in the face was crazy to me. Lawsuit, cool. Yeah, he got that. Y'all just don't get what I'm trying to say, bro. Hold on, let me fix it. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all just wasn't getting what I was trying to say at the time. Sorry. No need to be sorry, big I'm brother. sorry that I wasn't there for you, <clears throat> that I didn't help, and I, and I didn't live up to your standards. And then my father actually... Started crying. He started crying. Mm -hmm. He said, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be a bad, that I was a bad father. I'm sorry I didn't give you a good childhood, and I'm sorry I couldn't control my drinking. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had to suffer because of that. Addiction is real. You know? That's why I keep on saying when I say addiction is real, I don't think I'm better than I don't think I'm better than nobody. I tell y'all that a million times over and over. I got an addictive personality. If I like it, I'm on it. You know what I'm saying? When it comes to clothes, if I like it, I'm gonna get a lot of it. When it comes to jewelry, if I like it, I'm gonna get a lot of it. I start boxing, I love it. I can't stop. I'm addicted to it. Same way with the trees, bro. With that being said. The reason why I ain't tried no hard drugs, like no coke or nothing else, I don't feel like I'm better than nobody. If I did, y'all wouldn't have had DJ Ghost. He wouldn't have existed. I would have been a crackhead. That's all I would have wanted. I promise y'all. I've been hearing at the highest immaculate, bro. It's one of the best 15 minutes of your life. I like to have a good time. I love to feel good. But I see what that do to people. I'm not trying that, and I know how I am. I will be a crackhead, bro. I'm not lying to y'all. I would be on that day and night to keep on chasing it because I love, I love to feel good. I love a good feeling. His pops was addicted to alcohol. And when you're addicted to something, that comes over everything. You own, 
and you love, bro, it becomes number one priority. Look up addiction. That's why you can't really clown addicts like that. You can't really look up the word addiction, bro. That's why I never touched it. I never touched it. 20 years of pain, anger, frustration. It was crushed. We Don't hugged it bastard. out. And I, now we have a great relationship. Due to the yeah. pastor. When and I, when I said that about pastors and God, mind you, it's nothing wrong with it. You know what I'm saying? Right now, if you got evicted, what you gonna do? Pray. Your mom got cancer, what you gonna do? Pray. Your car got impounded, you gonna pray, you help you. If God wasn't around, bro, what you gonna do? Just stare at the wall? Like I do? Or just say, I'm gonna get through this. Prayer, God, it's good for, for the world, bro, it is. I'm just telling y'all how I feel about it. But it's good, it, it gives people peace. It let people relax. Like everything is eventually gonna be all right. God got me, this was supposed to happen. This is life. He got a bigger plan for me. I heard that so many times. My son got shot, but God got a bigger plan for me. Like, what the fuck? It's, just, it's no way in hell. My daughter would get hit by a car, and I say, God makes no mistakes. It was supposed to, it's please. Yeah. At my mama's funeral, I was so mad. I was like, oh, God, I said it on the podium, on her soul, on my kid's heartbeat. Went up there and gave my speech and said it, bro. That's how hard I was for my mama. I eventually apologized at the repast to my grandma and my aunties because they real Christians, you know what I'm saying? But that's how I felt. You know, and, and I didn't realize I, I said it in front of them. I didn't realize I said it inside of a church. But I don't think that I was at peace with us because my, my mama, my mama know how I felt about religion. You know what I'm saying? She do. Um, and I know a lot of y'all say it was wrong, and I, I, I agree with it. I got too many people in my life that I love that love God. It was wrong to say that, but my emotions couldn't stop it. I keep telling y'all that emotion, bro. You can't stop that. I was up there crying, giving my speech, bro. In front of 200 people, I did not care. You finna hear this. My mom was literally laying in a casket a fucking foot away from me, bro. You know what I'm saying? That shit was different. Looking, looking, with her beautiful ass arm, a little cute dead. Nails done, hair was popping, had her in the uh, with the uh. They put a little smile on her face and shit. If life go to plan, you're supposed to bury your mom. You're not, your mom not supposed to bury the kids, bro. All that was just going through my mind, just trying to deal with it, trying to deal with it, trying to deal with it. Trying to prepare myself for the funeral after she passed. Got two weeks till, we got nine days till, we got four days till, we got one day till. My whole, now let me see all the fat motherfuckers coming up in here that I know my mama didn't like them. Let me see that I know they didn't like my mama. I'm talking about friends, I'm talking about family, nigga. I'm being real, I'm just off that, bro. A lot of y'all don't know, and it's my first time saying it. Last Friday, my grandma just died, right? And it's just crazy to me. Her, me, her, at my mama funeral, literally, my mom made a year on February 6th. My grandma died a day after Valentine's Day, February 15th. So basically a year later, she's gone. Life is crazy to me, bro. I hate it. I hate it. I think about it. Well, so I would have been off myself, man. If I had kids. never followed what the pastor said, if I never trusted him and I trusted myself, if I tried to understand and wrap my head around still it, if I held my mind. own righteousness, I would have never experienced this. At the core of my heart, pastor was dissecting it and fixing it from the inside out. And when I seen that, I was so thankful. Wow, this pastor, he knows something that I don't know. For the first mm -hmm. time in my life, I didn't trust what I saw and what I felt, I left it in the hands of someone who was better than me, who knew God, who lived happier than me, who was more peaceful than me. And when I was connected to that, I was able to overcome everything. I see my father every week now, we go out to eat, and all we talk about is happiness and, and we're able to rekindle everything. 
And I never preached the gospel to my dad. I never told him about God. I just showed him, hey, you know, I'm happy, dad, and I love you. And that love really overcame everything, you know, so, you know. Forgiveness. Yeah, forgiveness. And it wasn't like I wanted to, but when I connected to something, you know, that was stronger than me, like my pastor, I was able to stay out of prison. I was able to kick the drugs. I was on meth and ecstasy. And his pastor was his big homie. That's one thing about me. I never had no big homie, never had no pops, never had no uncles that looked at me because their brother was locked up. None of that, bro. I had older homies. I think I would have turned out way different if I had a big homie in my life, you know what I'm saying? It's when people say the streets raised me, that's how it is with me. But I ain't talking about these OG niggas. It wasn't that, bro. Getting around, experiencing shit, slap boxing, fighting, um, having sex, bro, stealing, robbing, carrying guns. Nobody ever showed me or told me to do none of that. But when you, I was off the porch at like 11. When you that young, bro, you just basically being a follower. Everybody else doing it, you do it. Nobody to tell you, but like, it can't. And I grew up in a household, a banging house, a banging household. My daddy and my mama was bangers, bro. If you live with somebody, it's only for so long you can hide it till you start picking up on what they doing. Thought that shit was cool. You see it at school. Go to my cousin's house, they do it. Go to my auntie's house, they doing it. That's just how it was, bro. It wasn't no, his pastor was his big homie. And he didn't find no big homie till he became an adult. Today, nobody can big homie me. When it come to YouTube, when it come to entertaining, I'm open to a mentor, you know what I'm saying? But that that boat itself for me, ever in my life, I've been a big homie, bro. Ever. Coke. It wasn't that I did anything myself. I didn't even want the help. You know, a lot of people were on Skid Row and they, they talk about homelessness. Oh, the problem is homelessness. Well, if you peel that back, it could be mental issues, mental health. If you peel that back, it could be, you know, drugs and whatnot. But the truth is, it's at peel the core back, of the dude, heart. Just lost his I believe it's sin. And if you don't get rid of that aspect, then there's no, that begets everything else. It produces everything else. So I, I liken it to like the analogy of cancer. <clears throat> Say I have cancer. See, I don't like that how he's saying the pastor was. The root of it is sin, sin, sin. You're going to sin the rest of your life even when you don't want to, bro. I promise you. You gonna you can be all about God, but if you see somebody that's dressed stupid or whatever, you will laugh at it. Let's keep it 100. If you see somebody that did something like trip and fail when they was running to the bus stop, a lady that's probably like 55 years old, over rest, she trying to run and she fall, you laughing at it. Let's be 100. You see a female you like, and you end up having sex with her, that's a sin. Talking about people is a sin. Smoking weed is a sin. Swearing, meaning cussing, that's a sin, bro. Drinking alcohol is a sin. Getting tattoos on your body is a sin. Like, I don't get, if you peel back the layers, it's cause, it's cause you're, you're, you've been sinning. That's why you, that's everybody. That's everybody. That word sin is a religious word. That's why I don't rock with it, bro. It's just, you're a sinner. You, you, basically, you're a bad person since you was born. That's what they want to say. Or that's what he's saying, the pastor trying to say. But it's no way you can get rid of that. The pastor, I promise you, the sent a hundred times before this interview aired. I mean, since this interview aired. Or before. You can't shake a sin, bro. You can't. Lusting over other women when you married. Are you serious? I'm a man. I don't care if I've been married to the same woman for one year or 15 years. If a woman walk by with a body I like and she's naked, I'm looking. Mm. Probably get a little aroused, that's men. But in the Bible, that's lusting. You're not supposed to think like that. You have a wife. No. I didn't even know I looked. I'm a man that automatically looks. It's a naked woman right here, bro. I just, I don't get it. And if I'm losing my hair and if I'm losing weight, 
Well, if I put a wig on and I just eat and fatten up, it doesn't get rid of the cancer. So likewise, we have to get to the core of the issue. And the core of this issue right now is people's hearts. Their self-worth is completely gone. Their, it, it, when you, so when the, the pastor planted hope inside of my heart, it casted everything out. He never said, don't do this, stop doing drugs, stop gaming. He never told me that. He, ne he didn't give me a dime. You know, what he gave was hope inside of my heart. And when that happened, we naturally drop everything else that was hopeless. I clinged on to drugs because I thought that that was my hope. I clinged on to my gang because that was my hope at the time. But when God showed me another perspective, he talked. He talked about the pastor God. now. You know, he talked about Jesus and he said, why did, why do you think that uh, people, God showed me this, God did that, God did this. I don't, I've been homies before. And all. Tell me this, tell me this, tell me this. If y'all right now, bro, if y'all right now, right? You've been homeless on the corner for 20 years. Listen to me. Putting in job applications, trying to get you an apartment, nothing worked. You just got you an income tax check. It's gone. You just hit the lottery. Somebody stole all your money. You've been under, living under the bridge, under the freeway for 20 years. On your 21st year, you get an apartment. Is that God? God looked out for me. Thank God. Well, where was bro the last 20 years? I think people give God too much credit, bro. That wasn't God. You just got approved. You know what I'm saying? You just, you, they had a, a unit open. Somebody quit their job last night, and they was like, what's up with that boy that come up here all the time? Because if you don't give God the credit that one year for giving you uh, that apartment, bro, you got to give him the credit for keeping you homeless under that freeway for 20 years. Y'all be giving him too much credit, bro. I honestly feel. Like I said, I think it's a higher up. Nobody know who he is. And I honestly feel, if you're born here, it's on you to do what you want to do, bro. When you die, your spirit's released, and then it's the afterlife, which nobody know what it is, but they'll tell you what it is, even though they never died before. But being real. So you head off to the afterlife. That's what I think. But as far as God up here picking favorites, God made them rich and you poor, no. They worked harder than you. That's all that is, bro. You're lazy. I don't think he playing favors like that, bro. Got wars. These different races up here just kill. I don't think so. Hurricane Katrina, all these babies dying. I, come on, man. Come on, man. I don't think Jesus so. had to die for you. Well, because you're a sinner, you were born into sin, you can't stop sinning, so you'll always be empty, you'll always be miserable. But when you think about God, He paid for all of your sins. He made you righteous, and I'm like, He made me righteous? Like, I'm a sinner, I remember my sins. And He said, well, God doesn't remember them. Hebrews 10, 17, it says, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So, He said, you have a choice to make, Johnny. Are you gonna trust? If God don't remember sins, why would you die? And they say the reason you went to hell because you've been living in sin. But how I thought he remembered everything, but how God don't remember sin when he thought of the word or he thought of the consequence. Well, what the fuck? Did he say that or my children? I remember them. Hebrews 10 a sinner. I remember my sins. And he said, Well, God doesn't remember them. Hebrews 10 17. It says, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So he said, you have a choice to make, Johnny. Are you going to trust what you think and what you feel, which is constantly changing? It's like the <clears> ocean, <throat> high tide, low tide. One minute I love this woman, next minute we argue and fight. I hate her, I'm telling her to get out of my house. That's a Am I going to trust man. this heart that constantly changes? One minute I'm, I make a determination, I throw all of my pipes away. I'm not going to do drugs. Next minute I'm, I'm rummaging through the trash again, picking it all up. Am I gonna trust something that constantly changes? And he told me, if something is constantly changing, if a person says one thing and does another, he's a liar. So would you trust his heart that lies to you? Or are you gonna trust the word of God that never changes? No matter what, God died for you, he perfected you, he made you holy. And do change, that's why they got all these different Bibles, bro. Not one Bible is the same, that's what I'm saying. It all depends on what religion, because somebody watching this right now and be like, this fool Johnny need help. 
somebody from a religion right now and Johnny, they'd be like, he need help because ain't none of this true. And then Johnny can say that about them. It just, it, you believe in what you believe in, bro. You believe in what you believe in. That's Past, present, and future sins are my mama. You know, and when I believed, I put again myself down and my thoughts down and I trusted the word of God, that power became mine. And he likened it to the analogy of like a debt. Let's say, Mark, you know, I have $10,000 for you. And I say, let's go to Arizona, you know. And in Phoenix, in one week, I'll give you $10,000. If you believe in me, if you trust what I say, you will make that trip and you'll go out there and you'll receive the 10000 But let's say you don't believe in me. Ah, oh, Johnny's a gang member. He's just a guest on Soft White Underbelly. I don't believe him. Even if I go to Arizona with $10,000, you will not receive the blessing, right? So it's, it's important to where you put your beliefs in. People say, Lord is my, my savior. Well, what did he save you from? He saved you from your sins. So if he saved you from your sins and you still think you're a sinner, that must mean he failed and he did it. He says in the Bible that he's perfected us forever. It says in the Bible, it says in the Bible, Bro, you can get a Bible at Walmart and it's every uh, every other hotel room that you go to. That's, so y'all mean since Jesus been alive that the Bible ain't been rewrote not one time? If it's real, the whole story is just, it's just pure cap to me, bro. Like I said, if we ain't got God and lost, then we living in the purge. It keeps, it keeps the world sane, you know what I'm saying? It keeps the world sane. Ever. Right. So when I was able to believe that, that core of my heart changed. I went from emptiness to having hope. Well, where do righteous people go? Righteous people go to heaven. I always thought I was going to die and go maybe not to hell, but somewhere where evil people go because I was an evil person. I had did a lot of things yeah. that I'm not proud of. But, you know, as I had that hope that, hey, I don't have to live this way. This mind, this heart was deceiving me, telling me that I was you know, not righteous, telling me that I was evil, you know? And um, when you live that lifestyle, you start to believe, well, I'm evil anyway, so excuse my language, but fuck it. I'm gonna do whatever I want because your self-worth is gone. Your, your, your confidence, gone. Everything is out the window. So, you know, what I'm doing nowadays is I'm going to prison and I'm, I'm a prison minister. And I, I preach my testimony and this story to people, and it really. And I like he still dressed like that, bro. He a minister. I don't mock. I, I said mock him. I don't knock him for that. You know what I'm saying? The pastor changed his life, and that's what I told y'all earlier. When the pastor changed his life, as a pastor, you have to spread the word of God. You have to as much as you can. They feel like that's their duty. He going to prison. He been there before. He know a lot of people up in there are sinners. They don't believe in God, so he went. I don't knock him for it, I don't. It really changes their lives because everyone is telling people, hey, stop doing bad, stop doing evil. The problem is they're not understanding that trusting in themselves is the root of all evil because we're flawed as human beings, right? And if we're flawed, we cannot produce perfect things. We actually can't produce good things. We can try. But at the end of the day, we feel this emptiness. And what I call it is this up and down lifestyle. You know, when you're really happy, you're on the up. But when you're sad, you crash. So you're happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad until you die. There is no real purpose inside of your life, you know? And, and that's something that people really down, resonate with time. because I went through that. When I look at my life, I thought it was a curse. 12 years old in YA, like, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be dead. I'm supposed to be on the streets here with these people, strung out. Um, but <clears throat> as I see that God was leading my life, I see that it's such a blessing, blissful life. Why? Because I understand the people that, that these homeless people on the streets, they don't need money. They don't need, you know, clothes and, and all that, you know. They don't need, they need the fixing and the renewal of the heart. And so... You know, that's really what I've been doing nowadays is going to prisons and talking to, to, you know, inmates and double lifers, people with LWAP, life without parole. And I don't tell them, hey, you need to change. Why did you murder people? You know, you need to make a decision. No, what I tell them is, do you know what God did for you? Do you know? Get at y'all on the next one, bro. I got a lot of videos to do. Shout out to Johnny, though. This was dope, 100.